You're listening to Home Sweet Home with Russ McClellan and friends. And here's Russ. Hello, this is Russ McClellan. Thanks for tuning in. What are you doing listening to me right now? You should be outside playing with your friends and family and kids. Or not. Maybe you're doing both. Maybe you got some earbuds. That's the beautiful thing about technology, right? It's always a good thing. Nothing ever bad happens from tech. Social media, never been never been a problem with social media, has there? It's all old school. Sitting around, fire, listening to the radio, you know? No, or maybe not. The world's changing. Anyway, home sweet home with Russ McClellan and friends. Today, I have no friends. Well, I have JP, my producer. He's my friend today. You know, no, we're gonna, no, I'm not. <laughs> he says, no, he's not. You know what we're going to talk about today? Is I'm gonna just going to talk about some things that I've read uh, about mindset and what is going on in the world that we live in. 2020 was fascinating between politics and riots and police and George Floyd incident and race and a booming real estate market where we just saw more sales than ever in the history of mankind, I think. Uh, Fed cut the rate, federal fund rate to zero. It's hard to get below zero percent. Interest rates are an all-time low, around 2.75 at one point. Man, social media, algorithms, these are all exciting times, right? And, and we got told which business was essential and which one wasn't. We had polarization across the board. Wear a mask, wear 10 masks, wear no mask. Masks work, masks don't work. I find it fascinating that, that once upon a time when I reflect even in my life, and I'm 50, gonna be 52 next month. In my life, I remember an encyclopedia you wanted to do a book report, you had an Encyclopedia Britannica. Anybody remember that? I remember cassette tapes. I remember boom boxes where you actually, to get, a, to get a piece of music on your cassette tape, you actually had your blank cassette tape in the cassette recorder. When it came on the radio, you had to then with your AMX cassette tape record that song. You'd always be mad if you got the intro and not the, uh, not the song itself. And then just in one generation, bam, here we are, where we believe everything we read, we believe everything we hear, or we don't. We allow ideology to cut us in half. So you might be wondering why am I talking about all this stuff on a radio show that should be about real estate. It's funny because if I do get a complaint, it's once in a while that I'm not talking about real estate enough. <laughs> Which I think is funny, if you actually knew me. But uh, I kind of eat, breathe, sleep real estate. But I also eat, breathe, sleep mindset. And I've been through a lot. In my life, I you know, started out from scratch, essentially. I was very fortunate to have parents that were amazing. It was really the leave it to beaver land. For those people that don't know what that is, you should look it up on YouTube. But it was a good life, right? There is very, it was a very simple life growing up. I grew up in Manson where backyard football and motorcycle tag and, you know, just, I was lucky enough to have a dad and mom that worked very, very hard all day, every day, but were very supportive. I used to joke around and say, if, if I wanted to be a bank robber and I asked my parents what it would be like, they'd say, man, you're going to be a good bank robber. I mean, there was like very little control. That wasn't always a good thing because I got introduced to failure later on. And as you mature through that, you kind of rationalize failure as uh, a lesson, right? Fail fast, fail forward, fail often, fail forward. You know, and one of the things that I'm surprised about right now is we've grown our company to over 70 some real estate brokers. Oh, yeah, like five, six, seven generations of people. Some of our uh, brokers are more inclined to be born with an iPad in their, and have it in their crib than some of the people that are maybe older, my generation or older, that don't really like computers, don't really like tech. Minimalism is kind of a good thing. I'd rather, you know, be outside fly fishing or I'd rather be up in the mountains hunting or hiking 
than I would be staring at a phone. And it's not good or bad. You know, today I'm just making observations of where are we and, and where are we going? With the agents that I have, and I believe we have one of the best teams, if not the best team in the business. I'm very blessed. We're only two and a half years old. Paid out almost, you know, over three and a half million in commissions last year in 2020 in our second full calendar year to our, our broker's families. We also profit share at 49%. I believe in generosity. I believe in commitment. I believe in selflessness. All of these things should be in your business plan. So... If I sound a little righteous today, it's probably because I'm feeling a little righteous today, or at least I'm feeling authentic. And I think that word authenticity was maybe a word that in the last few years we've lost. Where it seems like we're always trying to be somebody we're not. I heard a quote the other day that I thought was fascinating. It said something like, you're not who you think you are. And you're not who other people think you are. You are what you think other people think you are. Perception. Well, and it's a real thing, right? What people think about us matters, whether it's in real estate or whether it's in business or whether it's in your personal life. If you're a jerk, you're a jerk, right? But sometimes in a judgmental society, where in 148 characters we've decided what used to take us a thousand pages in a book, do we really know? But boy, oh boy, I've experienced it in business. I thought growing up in the rumor mill or with the telegraph game in small town America where the one good thing about the rumor mill in small towns is you can kind of start your own when you feel like it. Just know, you know who to tell at the coffee shop and it'll be around town. So it's like counterintelligence. You've got to learn that trick when you grew up in a small town. So nobody really knows what to believe, but they believe everything they read. And the funny thing about now is this judgmental society online is dangerous so in so many ways. You know, you've seen kids that are locked down that can't go to school. And I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just trying to be authentic here. Like, they're sitting there for the first time, forced to be indoors for a while, and forced to be isolated. It causes problems, right? We all know this is not a good situation, right? But at some point, what I am wondering is, when, is it, when does it stop being somebody else's responsibility to make you happy? When do you start looking in the mirror? And start wondering what's holding you back and who are you really because if we if that person that said we are what other what we think other people think we are in other words what other people have decided who we are what we are etc is the reality because we're gonna listen to them tell us that's what we think and whether they think it or not it doesn't matter we're living in a non-authentic world we're not telling people the truth. We're not acting on the fact that we're, we're able to make good choices. In fact, if you really think about it, we're the only species, I think, that has reason, choices, thumbs, all those things we have going for us, and yet we destroy things around us. And we are what some people call L-A-Z-Y. It's kind of funny. It's like I was talking to a doctor about my knee. And he was saying, you know, some people are very, very overweight and they wonder why their knee hurts. Some people smoke four packs of cigarettes a day and they wonder why they can't breathe when they walk to the mailbox. I'm not being judgmental, man. If you want to smoke, smoke four packs a day, it's America. Do it. I mean, whatever. You, you want to eat cheeseburgers? Do it. But be careful about being surprised when you don't, when you're upset about not getting what you deserve because you didn't do the work to get it. And this entitlement culture, is it really going to serve you? 
Or maybe is it time to start having some self-awareness? Take a step back, take a stand, and decide you're gonna change your future and be positive and be selfless and be generous, be forgiving, show some grace, and quit being so damn judgmental of every single thing you see. Maybe it's time to be polite. Maybe it's time to have some manners. Maybe it's time to get off the couch and work your butt off. Like my dad, my mom, my grandparents, and everybody really before today had to do to earn what they got. And, and quit being a victim. You know, sometimes that victim mentality is true. Sometimes there are people, obviously, that are oppressed. Sometimes there are bad luck scenarios. But I can tell you from Michael Jordan being cut from his high school basketball team to Charles Branson with dyslexia to everybody in between. Colonel Sanders, I think, failed at like 27 businesses before in his mid-70s he even finally hit it with Kentucky Fried Chicken. I mean... Pain creates change if you let it. Adversity breeds clarity if you let it. Maybe it's time to be nice and take responsibility and maybe think for a change that not everybody has a right. Maybe everybody should have a responsibility. All right. I love being on my soapbox. I love being righteous in February 2021. I'll be right back in just a few seconds with segment two of Home Sweet Home with Russ McClellan. You're listening to Home Sweet Home with Russ McClellan and friends. And here's Russ. Hey, welcome back to Home Sweet Home with Russ McClellan or what in the heck is going on show. Maybe that's what we should call it today. What the heck is going on? What has happened to people? You know, and I'm not a doom and gloom guy. I'm actually a very positive person. I believe in affirmations. I believe in meditation. I'm a, a yogi guy. I feel f very lucky, I think, because, you know, at about that age where you've been at doing something a long time, and I've been in real estate 30 years or so, you just kind of eventually mature, I think is the right word, and realize that all you know for sure is you don't know very much. And then when you're young and you don't know very much, you have the confidence that you know everything. Now the question is, what is generational intelligence? Is there even such a thing? I grew up, my dad was a hardworking guy. His dad died in front of him in Manson when he was eight years old. His sister was drowning. My dad ran all the way down the street as the story was told to me. In 1938, no, 1941. In 1941, my dad's sister was drowning at the Little Manson swimming hole. My dad was eight. I think she was a little bit older. They both passed away now. Um, my dad passed away in April. But his dad ran all the way down the street, and he was pulling green chain at the time for a mill, so he had a lot of heavy clothes on, very hot day. Water's very cold. They assume he had a heart attack. So my dad, the reason I'm telling that part of this story is my dad grew up doing the best he could at being a great dad. And I believe he was the greatest of dads. And he did it by being positive. Well, I got, a, I got really lucky. I grew up in a great town of Manson. It was, you know, sports was a big deal. Played hard, not a lot of worries relative to most people on the planet Earth that had it much more difficult than I did. But my dad was also pretty straight up about some stuff. You know, kind of had a code. Treat other people like you want to be treated. I remember getting in trouble one time at elementary school, or maybe more than one time, let's not ask him. But I th there was a few times I might have been in trouble and maybe gotten a little fisticuffs here and there. But it was always about defending someone, uh, not a bully. I was too little uh, for that. But I, I remember getting bullied one time. Scared, scared me to death, right? But this was on a playground. Older kids, if I'm going to be honest, I think it was 
the kid's older sister. And if you want to be embarrassed as a young kid, get bullied by an older girl. That's worse. That's dramatic. You probably still need counseling. So one day, I don't think it was that situation, but with something similar, I popped a bully in the mouth, got in trouble, little fisticuffs, kids, right? My dad comes up and he says, what'd you do that for? Oh, I was picking on little Sally, whatever her name was. So he looks at the principal and he says, he was defending that little girl. I, I'm glad he punched him in the face. And then that was it, right? Like, okay, go home and, you know, just a weird time. It was common sense, right? Common sense. You have a, you had a responsibility and sure, we stood up in the back of picks up, pickups. We rode motorcycles without helmets. We did a lot of things we shouldn't have probably done that were dangerous. That of course, you know, you have to change once in a while. But I'll tell you what, my dad raised me in a way that I became very different than him in a lot of ways. My dad was a farmer, hard worker, every day, all day. He worked with me in real estate for 30 years, as a, you know, really became my best friend. And, but what was cool about it is I, I was a lot like him too. And what I'm really finding out that as you as the months have gone by now it's going to be about what may april be here finding that i'm more like him now that he's gone than i've ever been and i'm also finding and discovering at 50 something lessons that i'm just learning right now that he taught me maybe years ago that are kind of coming to the surface it's a very strange thing for anybody that's lost a father or mother or a loved one i remember a story about persistence that I wanted to share with you as it relates to getting through 2020 in maybe a humorous way. My dad was a cowboy. I often describe my dad as John Wayne, just smaller. He's an apple orchardist. He loved horses. So when I asked him at about eight years old or so that I, if I could get a horse, he said, sure, let's go ride one. Well, little did I know he was gonna take me to a rodeo and enter me into a junior rodeo and put me on a Shetland pony that had a flank strap. That was bucking out of a chute. And he's like, well, let's see how you like horses now. There wasn't a lot of abbreviation for that. So when you get in the back of a rodeo and you get on an animal and all his friends are around, you want to talk about peer pressure, it made standing up to bullies easy. And it's not like they gave you, you know, full grown horses when you're eight or full grown, you know, Brahma bulls when you're eight. They gave you calves, right? A little calf. But I'm telling you, when you're eight and you weigh like, you know, 40 pounds, it seems pretty big at the time. So he loved the idea. We had a travel trailer, a horse trailer. He got me a horse after riding a few rodeos. And then we started doing the barrel racing and the bull bending and the keyhole races and the, you know, breakaway roping for people that understand junior rodeos. That's what you do, or a little ribbon catch the road. I didn't do a lot of that, but I did all the other stuff and rode calves. And as I grew up every summer, that's what we did. One rodeo to another rodeo had a, had the little Terry 19 foot Terry travel trailer, the Dodge Ram charger pulling it. And for two years, I rode animals, you know, rough stock calves or steers and Shetlands or, you know, yearling horses, Got bucked off every time for two years. Every single time I hit the dirt. My dad, the whole time, to his credit, he was back there behind me, you know, picking me up by my belt loop, setting me down on animals, you know, psyching me up when I was getting scared. He'd get me down. And remember, this was no helmets, right? There were no helmets like they do now. That would be too smart. This was tough, straight up. The spurs, hold on to a rope, set on an animal. And what made it even more fun is that you really didn't have to breed bulls too much back then or animals, calves, steers. They just used electricity. That's right. They just stabbed the animal with electricity and it, you know, it's a matter of voltage. It'll buck. 
So they'd ask your father or whoever was helping you get down an animal. Sometimes when people didn't have uh, fathers or their other buddies or brothers or who you know helped each other too, they'd say, "You want to get the juice?" Yeah. All right. Let's shock them. Shock that animal. It'll buck. That way you get a better score. You see. Well, my dad did a great job of talking me into it a few times. I saw some people very hurt, and very bad. Um, more than once and I've been I've been hurt many times but again that first full two years every time I got bucked off he picked me up like I had just made the best ride in the history of rodeo the last year I rode which eventually I got out of it and a lot of my friends stayed in it it was a big deal where we grew up in Lake Chelan Valley a lot of them became very very good at it and professional riders I got out about that time where I started discovering sunshine, girls, boats, water skiing. And, you know, I had hay fever really bad. So going to a rodeo every single month, I just have allergy attacks every single weekend, I should say. It was just kind of like, man, I'd rather just, you know, I worked at night. I remember, uh, I don't know if on another show or, or this one, my dad, I worked for him in the orchard for a long time until he told me to get out of the orchard because I was too expensive. So I went to work at restaurants at night. It, there was a restaurant called Cats and Jammers. And the reason I'm giving you this little history lesson is the last year that I rode, I didn't get bucked off very much. I won a lot of buckles. I had new, you know, I was pretty fancy. I'd throw my hat in the crowd. I did all the things that you said. And again, there were no protective vests or helmets or anything like that. The funny part about the last, the first time that I rode though. So I remember the first two years I got bucked off. The last year I rode most, almost everything, won most everything. But the first ride that I made to the buzzer, I think it was a steer. I must have been like 10 years old. It went out, sat down, and didn't move. Now, you can get a re-ride if the animal doesn't buck, right? Well, this one got voltage and didn't buck. I don't know if it was old or hurt or what, but it just, I had my hand in the air, my other hand holding on to the rope, and I was going to ride it, and it just took about four steps and sat down. And there I am with my hand in the air, sitting on top of this steer. And when that buzzer rang, I jumped off of that steer thinking, yee-haw, threw my hat in the stands. And I swear, in hindsight, I look at it, I think all my dad's buddies that were looking at him like, I'm sorry, your son has a mental problem. He doesn't understand the rules, does he? he you know? And my dad, instead of feeling embarrassed, that I was acting like I just won the Super Bowl at 10 years old because I finally rode to the buzzer after two years, even though it sat down and didn't do anything. He picked me up and acted like I won the Super Bowl. Damn near started crying with me. That's the kind of dad my dad was. Well, I guess the moral of this segment is 2020 was kind of like that first two years of riding a steer and riding a calf, getting bucked off every time. And just as fast as you get bucked off for two years, you can make one ride, even if it doesn't look very good. And then you can start momentum in the right direction. When we come back, let's talk some more real estate, maybe. Thanks for tuning in. To Home Sweet Home with Russ McClellan. You're listening to Home Sweet Home with Russ McClellan and friends. And here's Russ. Hey, welcome back to Home Sweet Home with Russ McClellan. How's everybody this February day? Man, 2021, almost through winter. Appreciate you tuning in and telling stories, being righteous, doing all those things. That's why you tuned into a, or tuned into a real estate show today, isn't it? Listen to me preach. Hey, you know, 2021. What I know for sure is this. Everything is up to you. If you want to change something, you can change it. May not be easy. Failure is a big part of the real world, right? I was going to bring up a couple people that have failed because I know right now a lot of people are hurting. And a lot of people, at no fault of their own, are in trouble financially. And they don't deserve it. Home prices are climbing at a record pace. Is it going to crash? I don't know. I don't think so. But man, it's getting harder for a first-time home buyer. I know that. 
it's getting real tough to compete with money from somewhere else. So we need to increase the supply, but in the short term, that, that takes time. Real estate is not turn on a dime. It takes time to go up, it takes time to go down. Think about the Great Recession of 2008. It actually started in 2005. People just didn't see it. If you wanna learn about the Great Recession and maybe compare it, do two things. YouTube, 2008 versus 2021, you'll see a lot of funny articles about speculation. Or you can watch the movie, The Big Short. That was a good movie about the 2008 crash. I remember thinking after I went broke in the 2008 crash, right? Before that, I thought I was rich. It's kind of a funny parallel, isn't it? Like, or a dichotomy where you think one thing and the next day it's something else. Right about the time you feel like money's too easy, you should probably get out. And right now, a lot of crazy things happening. We have a lot of unemployment. We have a lot of people in forbearance. When that other shoe drops, what's gonna happen? Are rates gonna climb? People don't think so. People think it's gonna be okay. The Fed wants the rates to stay low, that helps. It's a dang near zero right now, the federal fund rate. So interest rates, 30 year mortgage, 2.75. You know, one of the differences between 2008 and 2021 collapse is in 2008, and we're going to talk to Michael Maher about this in the next segment a little bit. But in 2008, we, they offered what was called stated income loans, which basically meant you didn't have to show how much you made. They didn't really even care if you had a job. You could borrow almost as much as you wanted, and they would loan you money. Banks in general would loan you money. They got greedy, right? They got greedy because as rates climbed, and people don't remember this, but there was 17 rate hikes from 2006 to um, from 2000, 2006 to 2008 or 2004 to 2006, can't remember. There were 17 rate hikes in two years, three years. So as rates got as high as 6.25% on a 30-year fixed, if I remember right, 2008, that, that made it difficult. And at the same time, although we had a lot of sellers, homes were selling fast. So there was a lot of people buying because there was a lot more people qualifying, really people qualifying, many people that shouldn't have got a loan. So it was artificial. It was basically printed money that, you know, one day, and, and if you think about it, if you have a principal and interest loan, say on a $300,000 loan at 2.75% and you drop 20% down, your payment's gonna be about $1,000 principal and interest. Well, if it's an interest only loan, like they were given in 2008, you might only pay $600 a month. But here's the problem. Then the rates started clicking up. Remember, 17 rate hikes in three years. All of a sudden, your next statement was $400 more than the last one per month. And you were getting nowhere on the principal. And that was usually set up between two and 10 years on what's called an adjustable rate mortgage with a stated income loan qualifier, which was, they called them the liar loans because anybody could get a million bucks. All you had to do is just say, yeah, I, I want it. That's not what's happening now. I mean, money's hard to get. They passed the Dodd-Frank bill in 2010 that basically restricted credit. But by about 2012, 2013, started to go the other way. But at least now people are qualifying. Stock market was at an all-time high, but we have Massive unemployment due to COVID. Massive amounts of people, millions of people in forbearance. That's not going to end now, I think, till September. You better, but you have to check, right? Because every bank, every loan's different. There's so many things happening now that are unprecedented. It really is difficult. And don't let anybody tell you they know exactly what's going to happen in the future because we don't. Supply constraints are real. We know that people are now, now able to live anywhere they want to live and work. So getting in the game is probably a good idea, but be careful. Talk to some smart people. That's the financial side. There's the other side of the coin, right? There's a side of the coin that's like if you got your, your butt kicked in a street fight ever, or got punched in the nose, or in my case, got bucked off an animal two years straight. 
you kind of got to decide that you're done with that. You're done with negativity. You're done with feeling sorry for yourself. And I'm not a, you know, I don't have a lot of letters behind my name. So I'm, I don't necessarily claim to be a psychiatrist or counselor. I'm not even a life coach. I'm a real estate broker. But I know sometimes my dad used, you know, used to say, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And somewhere along the line, everybody got a red ribbon and blue ribbons were no longer popular. In other words, average was okay. Because if we weren't average, then that means somebody's feeling bad. Now, I'm not saying when we were, when we were in elementary school or high school, if you were the person that got picked last, that it was fun. You know what I mean? Like there was always, you pick sides at PE. I don't even think there's PE anymore half the time. For people that don't know what PE is, it's physical education. And we actually had a class like that in, in high school. But you know what happens? I know people that were picked last. That sucked for them. But they're doing amazing now. You know why? Because they got mad. They got mad about being picked last. And they decided they would, it was their responsibility to do well. Their responsibility to work hard. It wasn't their right to be given stuff, to be entitled. Now, it sounds, might sound harsh, but I think we coddle each other too much. I think every once in a while, like in real estate, if someone says, man, those leads suck. The leads for buyers aren't any good. Really? Well, did you know that after the seventh call to a lead, it jumps about 70% in converting that lead to an actual deal? In other words, if you leave a message once, that's not working in real estate. I'm specifically talking about our job, right? But the patience factor. What I tell our brokers is that lead generation and lead conversion aren't the same, and lead conversion requires patience and persistence. Saying the right things in the right order and working hard. Like three hours a day of lead generating, right? Sounds weird, huh? Well, digging a ditch for 10 hours a day sucks too. So you have to decide, is it the lead's fault or is it your fault that you're not getting what you want? Or are you still upset that you didn't get what you wanted because you didn't do the work that you should have? Or it's just society's fault that you don't have what you want? Struggle is the inspiration. Adversity can be the clarity, but you got to get mad. That's right. You got to pick a side. You got to get mad. I don't mean a side politically. I don't mean a side, you know, even in the physical world. I mean, just in your mind, decide which side of the coin are you going to be on? Are you going to be a victim? Or are you going to change it? Not everything needs to be fair or unfair. I coach with Fletcher Ellingson, by the way, if you ever want to talk to the guy, he's amazing. Mindset stuff. He's, he shared with me that once upon a time that we look at things as fair or unfair. The problem with that is there's a perpetrator and a victim. So if you say, well, that's not fair to me, well, then you're a victim, right? And you have to assume the victim role. And there's obviously a bad guy because, you, you know, you didn't self-inflict your pain. Okay, well... Maybe that's true. Maybe you didn't self-inflict your pain, but does it do any good to cry and spill milk? I mean, what's funny to me is that the more we went through 2020, the more my dad's lessons and sayings, don't cry and spill milk, two wrongs don't make a right, treat other people like you like to be treated. Anybody hear these things growing up? Do they say them anymore? The question is not that anybody's doing anything wrong, but I think we, I think we just kind of got to believe that today's the day that we start changing. Today's the day that it can be better. Be the exception. Quit pussyfooting around. If you want something, decide you want it. Start right now, and you can get to it. I think we're in for a good run if you decide you're in for a good run. Start being nice to people. It'll come back to you. I appreciate you tuning in today. 
I kind of got a little righteous. I do that once in a while. Let's just think about it from what you can control, not what you can't. Make today the day you start that. I appreciate it. One more time. Thanks for tuning in. Hey, get outside. All right, when we come right back, we'll be with Michael Maher and Prime Lending and find out what in the world he thinks about forbearance and the future of 2021 with mortgages. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be right back. Oh, sweet home. Oh, home, sweet home. Home, sweet home. Oh, oh, oh.